Well, did you see the sermon of the title? Why are you an Adventist? Why are you here? I heard about an Adventist pastor when he retired, he left the church. I don't know why he was an Adventist. Maybe he was an Adventist for the paycheck. But why are you an Adventist? Is it because your parents were Adventists? And there are a lot of people that's, you know, they, it's their parents' religion. Or is it because your friends are Adventists? Or is it because you went to Adventist schools you, and learned to eat veggie meat? <laughs> I can tell you, the first time I ate veggie meat, I told the guy next to me in the academy, I thought they were feeding us dog food. <laughs> now I'm a dog. <laughs> or maybe because you work for an Adventist entity, and you think you have to be an Adventist. Or could it be because you're passionately in love with Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. <laughs> And, and understanding that question, why are you an Adventist, depends a lot on your understanding the origin and the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The proclamation of the three angels' messages Amen. is the core value of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. The Adventist Church, let's, do, to, let's travel down a little lane of history. And we were part of the Millerite movement. Remember, William Miller was preaching the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And he was basing his understanding of the soon coming of Christ on Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What, what Miller didn't understand was there are two sanctuaries. He was thinking that Jesus was coming to cleanse the earthly sanctuary. And thousands gathered with him. And October 22, 1844, came and went with a lot of tears, a lot of disappointment and hopelessness. And many thousands left the Millerite movement. But God is so gracious. And he opened the eyes of believers and said, there's a second sanctuary. Amen. And Daniel 8, 14 is talking about the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Amen. When Jesus began the final phase of his judgment ministry. Hallelujah. And so the pioneers began to dig and study in the scriptures of Revelation and Daniel. And they hung on to this promise. If you open your Bibles to Revelation 14, and you go down to verse 14, they continue to hang on to this promise. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. Then I looked, and a white cloud appeared, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, he had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Verse 15, Then another angel came out of the temple, shouting with a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and start to reap, because the time to reap has come since the earth's harvest is ripe. Verse 16, And so the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. John describing the one in the cloud is talking about Jesus Christ, who is ready to come. Jesus is ready to come. Isn't that good news? Amen. And so the pioneers began to focus on these three angels, realizing this was our mission. The angel, the first angel in the midst of heaven, having the eternal gospel to preach unto all the world that Jesus Christ is coming. Now we've talked about the first angel's message and we've talked about the second angel's message. This morning we need to zone in on that third angel. The consequence of receiving the mark. Go back to verse 10. <clears throat> the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone and the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. 
pretty intense, isn't it? Yeah. All this fire and brimstone. And in the smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day and night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. There's two things that John is doing here. He's looking back at Old Testament writers who have told us that when, when God's people were out of harmony with God, that there were consequences. And here in Revelation, the 30th message, he's saying, the consequence of not being patched in love with Jesus is to suffer eternal death. That's a consequence that God has no control over because he will not force his will upon us. And the second thing is John says, if you have that mark, mark on the forehead or mark on the hand, and John is using a Greek word that refers to the Caesar's seal, the Caesar's mark, an image on the coins or on official documents or on wood or stones, they would carve an image. That's the picture that John is writing about. The beast mark on the forehead and the hand represent the authority of the apostate church, the replacement of God's righteousness with man's righteousness. And that's why one of God's center focus of his people is the people who are in love with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the first angel message reminds us that God is our creator. Yes. He made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs, and that first angel's message is very much similar to the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea that's in them, but rested on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath played an important role in the worship of God's people, both in the Old Testament and today. God's people have understood that the Sabbath sustains us. It gives us a sense of hope, a sense of a future deliverance, a messianic peace. God's people understood the Sabbath not only being about creation, about deliverance, about liberation, about redemption. The Sabbath serves even today as a sign of God's covenant relationship that we have with Him. And that's why the early pioneers included the seventh day as part of the identifying title of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It reflects our commitment to God. We don't keep the Sabbath because it's the right day. We keep the Sabbath because we're committed to our God. Amen. He is our creator. He is our redeemer. He gives us a true sense of meaning, of existence, and of hope. But there's that second word in our name, Adventist. So we're not only committed to God as Sabbath keepers, but we're also committed to God in sharing the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ. These two events, the Sabbath and the soon coming of Christ, are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega of earth's history. Let's move a little further in history in the 1880s. Adventists were on fire preaching the three angels' messages. And then we come to 1888. Anybody know what happened in 1888? You might not think of it in these terms. It was the most explosive and significant meaning the denomination had ever had. It was the scariest time for the devil. So, for you to understand what I'm trying to say, we need to go back a little bit and see how all this came together. The devil began to realize that this small cluster of remnant people were serious about their faith in God and were serious about being ready for the soon coming of Jesus. And so 
he began, he, he took out the entire kitchen sink of, of heresy and threw it at God's people. Amen. You realize that many of our early leaders were, were anti-Trinitarians. Was several of our early pioneers came out of the Christian Brethren Church, like James White. Christian Brethren were anti-Trinitarians. Uriah Smith was an anti-Trinitarian. Can you imagine what it must have been like when James and Ellen went to bed and they started talking about the Trinity? She was a Methodist. She was a Trinitarian. He was Christian Brethren. He was anti-Trinitarian. But it's kind of hard to argue with a prophet, isn't it? <laughs> she always had that trump card. And so the, this anti-Trinitarian doctrine, you know, the church began to get it right. 1888 to about 1940. You know, it still pops up every so often. You hear, you hear about someone who says they're anti-Trinitarians. I remember I was preaching at my church in Little Rock, no, excuse me, in Hot Springs, Arkansas. You know, Hot Springs, South Dakota. There is a Hot Springs, Arkansas, too. Yeah. It was in Hot Springs, South Dakota. And this gentleman came up to me and he said to me, I am a historic Adventist. Now, I knew what that meant, but I didn't know if he knew what it meant. So I said, pre or post-1940. Because see, the Trinitarian doctrine doesn't show up in our theological positions until the 1940s. Well, he got upset. I don't know if he got upset because he wasn't sure what I meant. But to be a historic Adventist means that you believe everything up to 1940. And so the church began to remove all anti-Trinitarian teachings. Did you know that included the book Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith? Because remember, Uriah was an anti-Trinitarian. He believed that Jesus was created. He's got a wonderful book. It's wrong, but it's a wonderful book. And one of the most famous books written, Bible readings from the home, had to be purged of its anti-Trinitarian position. By <coughs> 1940, the church was free of that. But that was only the beginning. There were other doctrines that the devil was throwing at the church, like holy flesh doctrine, perfection, the, the nature of Christ. You know, we're still fighting over some of these things. It's no wonder we're still here, stranded. But to understand what was happening in 1888, we need to go back a little bit. Because the 1800s was not a normal time for God's reign of people. It is a period where the United States was progressively moving towards Sunday legislation. Mm. By 1860, the National Reform Association came into being. They did not want to make America great. They wanted to make America Christian again. And the, their major platform was Sunday sacredness. And by the early 1800s, some Adventists had come, some people in America had come to see Adventists as a problem. Yes. Today's terminology, they would see them as terrorists. Mm -hmm. You ever thought of yourself as a terrorist? Mm -hmm. That's how, in the 1860s, people in America were seeing Seventh-day Adventists. 1882, W.C. White, James White's youngest son, was arrested for operating the Pacific Press on Sunday. Yeah. 1885, Adventists were being arrested in Arkansas. 1888, Tennessee and other states, they were being arrested for Sunday desecration. Now, I remember when, I, when my wife and I moved to South Dakota. And one Sunday, I went to the grocery store and I saw this yellow tape, not for sale. No liquor, no cigarettes. I, I thought they should keep that up every day. <laughs> but you also couldn't buy milk. It was kind of a strange law, these Sunday laws. Because you could go into that grocery store 
and you could buy baby diapers, but you couldn't buy baby formula. A strange law for Sunday sacredness. And several of our Adventist pastors were in chain gangs because of Sunday desecration. The high mark came May 21, 1888. The New Hampshire Senator H.W. Blair introduced a bill into the United States Senate promoting the Lord's Day as a religious day of worship. It was the first time since 1840 such a bill had been brought into existence. And the Seventh-day Adventists at that time did not miss the significance. They thought, man, Jesus is coming. Some legislation, the beast cannot buy or sell. They were seeing the fulfillment of Revelation 13 and the fulfillment of Revelation 14. And they were excited. And because they were excited, the devil was terrified. So he, can, so he began trusting all of these internal arguments in God's church. So I mentioned earlier the Holy Flesh, perfectionism, pantheism, And the law versus righteous by faith. This is kind of strange we'd be fighting over that, but I remember as a young Adventist hearing people talk about cheap grace. We're still in 1888 fighting, aren't we? Yes. So it's not surprising that some of our Adventist leaders became violently upset when Ellen White and Wagner and Jones began preaching Christ our righteousness began preaching that the law of Galatians was not the, not the ceremonial law, but the moral law. So it's, it's not surprising there was this tension, this internal fighting. And, and when you, you think of a church that's on the verge of being ready for the soon coming of Christ, people say, oh, you, you can't teach that. Because we're getting ready to go to heaven. You know, Jones was an aggressive student of prophecy. And he began to have a new interpretation of Daniel 7. And Uriah Smith was not, not mildly upset, but horrifically upset that, Latin, that Jones would have a different interpretation than he had. Excuse me, he had. Because Uriah Smith saw himself as the authority of interpretation of Bible prophecy. And Butler, George Butler, president of the General Conference, saw Wagner's teaching as, as an overthrow of the denomination's teaching of the law. Yeah. And it was a terrible time. Here you've got the Sunday laws being pushed, and people getting ready for the soon coming of Jesus, and the Adventist church and a fist fight. Yes. A terrible time to be saying, well, Jesus is coming, but well, we're going to fight. Your ideas are wrong, and we're not going to listen to you anymore. And the crisis grew between 18, 1886 and 1888. And culminated, or overflowed, with the general conference session. And one historian put it this way, said, unfortunately, given the emotional laden atmosphere and the strong personalities, the conference turned out to be a confrontation and somewhat less Christian. Isn't that terrible? Ellen White wrote, they had thoroughly imbibed the distinctive Adventist doctrines of the law, the sanctuary, and so on, but they did not understand what it meant to be saved by the righteousness of Christ and the sanctifying of his love. Mm. It's kind of hard to handle, isn't it? Yes. The other one says to the general conference, you're not in love with Jesus. She saw Smith and Butler and others not understanding what it meant to be Christ in So she began, you know, that's one Books like Steps to Christ, Christ's Object Lesson, Desire of Ages, these books came out 
emphasizing, focusing on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me illustrate this one. In South Dakota, a lot of people who have farms and ranches and raise sheep. And you've probably heard the expression, sheep aren't too intelligent. Well, sheep give birth to their lambs in January and February in the Dakotas. Do you know how cold it is in January and February in the Dakotas? It gets a 40 below zero. And these poor mothers are giving birth to their babies. And a lot of those lambs don't survive. And a lot of those mothers don't survive. And so the, the ranchers, they try to take a lamb and put it with a mother who lost her sheep. But did you know that a mother sheep will not allow a baby lamb to milk if it's not her lamb? She would stand there and let that baby die before she'd give it milk. So you know what the, what, the, what the rancher does? He skins the dead lamb. Puts that skin on top of this poor orphan lamb. The mother smells it and says, that's my baby. And then they bond together. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Woo. He shared his life that we could be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Because of Christ's blood, God accepts us as his own. Once we were orphans, now we're God's adopted children. Continuing on, Ella White wrote for this 1880 General Conference session, my brother during this, during the meeting, she wrote, few weeks later, was to present Jesus and his love before my brother. I saw marked evidence that many had not the Spirit of Christ. She says, what we want is Christ-centered truth. And she went on and says, I have seen that precious souls who would have embraced the Adventist teaching turned away because they didn't see Jesus. I attended a ministerial meeting in Fargo, North Dakota. Pastors from different denominations. It's got a good way to be Know what's going on. And one month they asked me to have the devotion, so I did. And I preached about Jesus. And a couple of those ministers came to me and said, you know, I didn't know Adventists believed in Jesus. We're not doing a very good job, are we? And some tried to argue, and tried to argue that the message of Jones and Wagner was uniquely Seventh-day Adventists. The Wagner wrote, I do not regard this view, which I hold as a new idea. It is not a new theory, but doctrine. He argued, would it simply be a step nearer the faith of great reformers in the days of Paul, the days of Luther, Tyndall, Wycliffe, and many others? It would be a step closer to the heart of the third angel's message. Yeah. You know, we still have this tension of some saying we need to be distinctly different from the rest of the Christian world. And for those who would argue, we need to show that our roots are tied within Christianity. Because we get confused with two other churches, don't we? The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Did you, have you ever seen those Mormon ads? Did you know that when the Mormons advertise, there's a greater interest in Adventists? And when Adventists advertise, there's a greater interest in Mormonism. So I think we need to tell those Mormons to advertise more. <laughs> so people will start wanting to know about Adventists. And she went on to say, the Lord desires us all to be learners in the school of Christ. So God is presenting to the minds of men divinely appointed precious gems of truth appropriate for our time. God has rescued these truths from cha champions of error and has placed them in the proper framework. Brethren, God has most precious light for his people. I call it not new light, but oh, it is strongly, strangely new.
to many. Mm. About a month later, she wrote, had the privilege been granted him, as we to Wagner, to speak plainly and presenting his views upon justification of, by faith and righteousness of Christ in the relations to the law, this was no new light, but it was old light, place where it should be. In the third angel's message. Amen. Now, a lot of people, when they preach a third angel's message, they focus almost exclusively on the mark of the beast. They're always telling us that's the, that's, we've missed the point. In 1888, we discovered that the third angel's message is Christ our righteousness. Amen. And, what, and what she told our leaders is you cannot separate verse 12 from the three angels' message. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The only told our leaders, you've got the first two right. You have that patient faith. Just think what it must have been right for many of them to go to October 22, 1844 and have their hopes dashed. But they hung on in their trust and just knew that there had to be something to explain this. And then to say the Sunday laws, it says, she told to our leaders, you're good at being faithful. And keep the commandments of God. She said, you know, for the last 40 years, we have been preaching the eternal commandments of God. The eternal Ten Commandments. So we've been preaching so much that we've come dry. And so, so many people have turned away because they don't see Jesus. What we're preaching it says you you must not lose sight of that third part of Revelation 14 12. Here is the patience of the saints. For those who keep commands God, and they have what? The faith, the faith of Jesus. The third angel's message is about Christ our righteousness. Amen. She said, Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin-pardoning Savior. And that was unsettling for many, for many of our pastors, for many of our leaders in the division, to the general conference. There was this tension. There was this great missed opportunity. The world was caving in. Satan was trying to destroy his remnant. And we bought into it. And we're still buying into it. We're still fighting over the nature of Christ. We're still fighting over perfectionism. We're still fighting over righteous by faith. In 1890, she was at a minister's meeting and she told the ministers, go out and preach Christ our righteousness. And I said, many will say you're just too excited. You know, we tend to be more reserved, don't we? Since when you talk about Jesus and his love, since people will say you're just too excited. You're making too much of this matter. You do not think enough of the law. Now you must think more of the law. You ever heard that? The law, the law. And she says it needs to be Christ in the law. Amen. So she told those pastors to go out. In fact, I love the statement she said, so we have been at work on the law until we got as dry as the hills of Gaboa. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus. May God help us that our eyes may be anointed with eyesight that we may see. 1888 was the baptizing of Adventism and Christianity. It was the truths that had been hidden and buried Finally, the Adventist Church began to understand the third angel's message. We could finally preach the full gospel message. They could go to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people, and prepare people for the great Adventist harvest. And tell people, 
He has done his law. But Jesus is the very center of that law. Sometimes we settle for less. Sort of like this young boy at school, there was a poster put up that said that the circus was coming. So he ran home and he told his parents about it. They were very poor. They were dirt poor. And the father said to his son, I recognize this means a lot to you.